This video is part of consumer theory. In it, I will discuss preferences by introducing indifference curves. An indifference curve is the graphical set of all bundles of goods that an individual views as equally desirable. That is, every bundle on an indifference curve gives a consumer the same amount of pleasure. Each indifference curve corresponds to a certain level of pleasure or happiness. Note that because preferences are very specific to the individual, indifference curves are specific to an individual as well. Here's an example of an indifference curve. It shows all the different bundles or combinations of Coke and pizza among which a consumer is indifferent. That is, any two bundles on this indifference curve would be ranked as equally desirable. Usually when we draw indifference curves, they have two defining characteristics, downward sloping and convex to the origin. I will discuss what convexity means at the end of this video. For now, let me focus on downward sloping. An indifference curve slopes down when we assume monotonicity or non-satiation holds. That is, if more is better for each good, then indifference curves have to slope down. Say we're at point A, consuming roughly three units of Coke and roughly five units of pizza. If we give this consumer more Coke, moving from A to B, more Coke, that's going to make them better off. In order to keep them indifferent or as well off, more Coke has to come with less pizza. In other words, there has to be a trade-off. When both goods are good goods, when more is better, the only way to keep someone as well off when giving them more of one good is to take away some of the other. This is why indifference curves are downward sloping when we assume monotonicity of preferences holds. One indifference curve represents all the bundles that give a consumer one level of happiness. An indifference map is the complete set of indifference curves that summarize an individual's tastes. An indifference map we can think of as more than one indifference curve, typically at least three. For example, here is an indifference map, or four indifference curves, summarizing four different levels of happiness and all the different combinations of Coke and pizza that could attain each of those four levels of happiness. Notice that when more is better, the further we move in this direction away from the origin, the higher the level of utility. That is, any bundle on IC4, regardless of where it's located, is strictly preferred to any bundle on IC3. Any bundle on IC3, regardless of where it's located, is strictly preferred to every bundle on IC2. If preferences are rational, meaning complete and transitive, and are also monotonic, then four properties of an indifference curves must hold when drawing an indifference map. The first is that every bundle must lie on an indifference curve. That's due to the assumption of completeness. Completeness says consumers can rank any two bundles of goods. Thus, any bundle can be described by some indifference curve. The second property is that bundles on indifference curves farther from the origin are preferred to those on difference curves closer to the origin. This comes from the assumption of monotonicity. Again, if more is better, then the further we move in the northeast direction from the origin, the higher the level of happiness. The third property is that indifference curves can't cross, and the fourth is that they can't slope upward. To explain why indifference curves can't cross each other, let's consider what happens if they do. Graph A shows two indifference curves crossing. Both bundles E and A are on the same indifference curve, and so by definition of an indifference curve, the consumer ranks them as equally desirable or is indifferent between them. Likewise, bundles E and B are on the same indifference curve, 
And so by definition of an indifference curve, the consumer would also be indifferent between E and B. Now, because we assume preferences are transitive, since E is just as good as A and E is just as good as B, it should follow that A is indifferent to B. However, when we look at B versus A, Bundle B has more pizza and more burritos than Bundle A. So by non-satiation or monotonicity, B should strictly be preferred to A. Herein lies the contradiction. We can't simultaneously rank A as indifferent to B and B as strictly preferred to A. That is why indifference curves can't cross each other. Now, most of the time, students don't literally cross their indifference curves, but they do something like this. They draw two indifference curves that, if extended, would cross each other. This is also a no-no, because a simple extension of IC2 here would then cause the curves to cross each other. Another impossible indifference curve, when we assume preferences are rational and monotonic, is an indifference curve that slopes up. Why is that? Well, again, by definition of an indifference curve, since A and B are on the same indifference curve, the consumer is indifferent between them. However, when we look at bundle B, it has more pizza and more burritos compared to bundle A. So by non-satiation, B should strictly be preferred to A. Again, this is a contradiction. We can't simultaneously rank A as indifferent to B and B as strictly preferred to A. For that reason, indifference curves can't slope up. Now again, students don't often literally have indifference curves slope up when we assume non-satiation, but sometimes they do something like this, and really I think this is a matter of not picking your pencil up quickly enough to get this little tail on an indifference curve. So be careful of these tails because they do show the indifference curve sloping up, which again would necessarily violate the assumption of non-satiation. The curvature of an indifference curve tells us the rate at which an individual is willing to trade between the goods. Again, usually we draw indifference curves as downward sloping and convex to the origin, like the example presented here. As we move down along a convex indifference curve, the individuals willing to trade decreasing or smaller and smaller amounts of one good for each additional unit of the other good. You can see that here. When the consumer moves from this point to this point, gaining one additional Coke, she's willing to give up this much pizza, or this is how much pizza she's willing to trade for one more Coke, the second Coke, in order to remain as well off. In comparison, when we give her one more Coke here, giving her the 10th Coke, now the amount of pizza she's willing to trade is smaller. She's willing to give up smaller and smaller amounts of pizza for each additional Coke. That's true when preferences are convex. We usually assume that's the case. We usually assume that the rate at which a consumer is willing to trade one good for the other is indeed diminishing. However, we will sometimes relax this.